here is somebody, uh, a surgeon who I've been following for a long time on LinkedIn. We actually got connected many years ago. And that's Dr. Daniel Paul. Uh, Dr. Paul caught my eye, one, because he had fantastic content, pretty much taking uh, n holding no, no punches back on how broken the healthcare system is. And more importantly, Dr. Paul designed a completely new way of doing the business of medicine. And I think it's extremely admirable because he took this big jump fresh out of fellowship and decided he's going to do things his own ways. And over the last uh, year, because Dr. Paul has gotten so much inbound uh, requests, I send a lot of physicians to him as well about how do you run an insurance-free medical practice. He decided to start a course. And so I'm going to go ahead and share that course. You can go to insurancefreemedicalpractice.com. You can use the code webinar promo and you get a discount for it. It's a great course. I checked it out. I really like it a lot. There's a private group. We'll get into all that in a moment. But first, as always, let me start off the show as we always do with this one question. Comment what city you're joining in from. So go ahead and comment what city you're joining in from. Unless you're driving, I don't want you to comment at all. <laughs> so let me bring him onto stage. Dr. Paul, how are you doing? Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Thanks for uh, having me on. I'm excited Fantastic. to kind of talk about this. This is something that I actually do. So this isn't just stuff I'm making up. This is things I've learned over a period of time. So I'm happy to to share. I'm going to get a lot of requests for it. So um, I finally said, you know what? I'm going to put it together. And, and here we are. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then uh, Marty Nichols says, Dr. Paul, a house call for the ailing business. Looking forward to a great hour. Hey, Marty, thanks for joining. So I know a lot of people are excited about this. Um, and maybe before we uh, start the uh, presentation, Dr. Paul, maybe you can share a little bit about uh, yourself, your background for those who are just getting to, to learn about you. Yeah, sure. So I'll go over my origin story in a little bit, but basically five-year full orthopedic surgery residency. Um, I have my own practice out in Colorado Springs is where my wife is from. I don't work with any insurances. I've opted out of Medicare and uh, it's really, really a wonderful way of practicing. Um, I've had to figure a lot of it out, but it really does work. And I want more people to do it because we really need to disrupt this system. And if we all just keep working with hospitals and insurance companies, we never will. So that's really my, my driving force behind a lot of what I do. Fantastic. Fantastic. And something I wanted to uh, specifically ask you about is you, you put together this course. Why did you decide to put a course together? Well, I, I get a lot of requests for how do you do this or how do you do that? And then people started asking me, it's like, you really should put a course together saying what you do. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I should. It's, it's really as simple as that. So kind of started on it and came up with a bunch of, I think we have 35 different topics. Um, and it just covers everything that I know and everything that I do. I mean, ground up. Um, but, uh, I just, I just feel like it was, something like that wasn't out there and, you know, I feel like I was in the position to put it out there. So that's what I wanted to do. Fantastic. Fantastic. I love it. And just for everybody to, uh, you know, I'll be emailing this out to everybody afterwards, but just in case some of you guys are, uh, eager to get it now, uh, you can unlock, uh, your, uh, CME credit, uh, in this link, I'm dropping it in the chat. So that way you can all get an AMA PRA a category one CME credit. Dr. Paul also, uh, you'll see in a little bit, the master class that he's put together, it comes with 35 CME credits, which is insane, but that's awesome. Um, and real quick, yeah, we got a lot of people watching, so let's bring some people up. We got uh, Skrna, uh, uh, Srikanth, Srikanth uh, joining in from Lexington, Kentucky. Thank you for joining us. We got Christopher coming from Columbus, Ohio. Marty down in the great state of Texas and Austin. We have another uh, physician from Boca Raton, Florida. We got Colin Liu, Dr. Liu Hay from San Diego, California. Dr. Stretha uh, from Pueblo, Colorado. Um, and many, many others. <laughs> I don't know who this link to. Disruption. Yes. You got Disruption. It, you know, one thing I'll, I'll say, because we were Dr. Paul and I were talking about it earlier, I think what he's doing is actually beyond disruption because disruption usually means that you're working within an existing system and the existing rules. He's kind of walked away from the healthcare system overall and decided to practice medicine on his terms, which is really admirable. And that's really the true culture of medicine, right? Is practicing on your own term. Oh, another uh, Dr. Uh, Verma. That's the face I know from Columbus, Ohio. Thank you, doctor, for joining us. So, uh, 
Daniel, why don't we go ahead and just uh, get started? We have a lot of people watching, so let me uh, take this off. If you could share your uh, screen and we'll uh, jump right into it. All right, give me a second here. And for those watching, by the way, we're going to do a live Q&A at the end. So if you have a question, go ahead and comment at any point. And at the Q&A section, I'm going to bring them up and Dr. Paul is going to answer them, okay? All right, can you see my slides okay? Let's see. There they are. I'm going to take myself out and it's the floor is all yours, my friend. All righty. Okay. So three secrets to launch an insurance free medical practice. Again, this is something I do. I'm, I'm, I'm completely out of the system. It's one of the best things I've ever done. So I'm going to talk a little bit about really how I got there. So I really got derailed. Um, a couple of things were happening. One, I was in a fellowship, uh, which, um, and it was not really a positive ed educational experience. Um, those of you who are docs know exactly what I mean here. So that's number one that's going on. It was a fellowship in hand surgery. I just finished my residency and took part one and passed it. And then I'm looking for job opportunities. And my wife is from Colorado. And I've dragged her all over the country from Florida to Ohio, everywhere in between. And I can't freaking find one. I mean, my gosh. What I find, it's like, hey, take our entire call for our entire practice 24-7 or here's a four month guarantee, you know, in standards, two years, I'm really bad stuff. Um, and so finally I interviewed for a job out in Connecticut cause I couldn't find anything in Colorado where, where I grew up. And all it was is talking to this old bitter senior partner. And I've got this picture here and maybe, you know, this doc, if you're an ortho, forget the stethoscope part, right? I haven't used that in years. And he's just telling me how much money he made in the early nineties. He was just so bitter and like how little he was paying his new junior attendings. So I talked to a junior attending and I'm like, are you happy here? And he goes, well, it's getting better. That's literally what it sounded like. And like he was miserable. He was going into the ER to do his own reductions. And he just, nobody was given, throwing him a bone and he was miserable. And it kind of created this existential crisis in myself between those two things, kind of created this negative ball of energy. So I'm like, what am I going to do? And I'm posting this picture. This is not a stock picture. This is somebody I know. His name's Jared Mate or Dr. Mate. Um, I went to medical school with him and he actually quit his residency and he just went out on his own and started doing house calls. And at the time, you know, he got a bunch of photos and I remember laughing at him. I remember going on a website, all in clinic in residency. And like, I think my chairman said like, oh, he, he looks like a gigolo. My chairman talked weird, but you know, we're all kind of laughing at him. He just sort of defected early on. This was a long time ago. And we're just like, you know, what is he doing? And then I realized that he was probably right. So um, it just, the opportunities did not look good. I said, like, am I going to be doing this forever? Am I just going to be grinding it out forever? I just kind of had a view of the future. So I talked with my friend, Jared, Dr. Maid. And what I did was I quit my fellowship, which is not normally done. It's only a year fellowship. I'm halfway through. I broke my lease and I moved in with my in-laws into their basement. I lived in that basement for almost two years while I figured this thing out, right? My friends are starting jobs at making hundreds of thousands of dollars and I'm living in the freaking basement rubbing two sticks together. And that was about four and a half years ago. Now you can see I'm in my own basement. So a real step up in the world, but I spent the last four and a half years basically growing and figuring this out. And, and no one really told me what to do or how to do it. And it's a lot of trial by error. And, and that's kind of what I've done. Um, so here are the results. Now you can see a picture. Now there's me doing a house call, right? So I can make fun of myself now. Um, but I noticed that when I started this model, even though I wasn't busy in the beginning, I was immediately happy. I was much happier is the best career move I think I've ever made. And like, I've had so much free time since then. It's kind of unfathomable cons considering how much, you know, how little you have as a doc working. So this, uh, that, you know, the lots of free time and being immediately happier are two things that you get immediately. So Let's talk about why docs fail or why you fail, you know, or, you know, if you have your own practice. So the standard practice, you can't control your costs, right? You can't control them. And, they're, and most of them are insurance related. So with an insurance based, if you take insurance, it forces you into a high volume practice. So you need a lot of staff to support that. You know, uh, I've seen it. You're, you're talking an average of five to one, but I've seen as high as 21 to one. There was a pain doc in town and I met him and he had a bustling office, but it was just him. And he had a staff of 21 people, 11 of which were full time. He is only one Medicare cut away from being insolvent. If Medicare all of a sudden says, hey, we're not we're, we're going to pay you less for facet joint injections and epidurals. He's out of business. Right. And we'll get to that aspect later. But 
they force you to have these coders. They force you to have these billers. You know, they force you with these clunky EMRs. Now you got to house all this staff. So you get these huge office space and all these rules and regulations, which by the way, are insurance based. If you remove insurance, most of those rules and regulations disappear. There's not too many legal things that you can or can't do as a physician. They don't like to put laws in place saying that. So they do it with reimbursements. So you can't control your costs, which tend to balloon up as time goes on and insurance adds more hoops. And like I said, average five per doc, seen as high as 21, even 10 plus isn't rare. You get some of these large orthopedic groups, you can get easily over 10 people per doctor just to make the business run. And if your practice, this is a stock photo looks like this. I mean, that's a problem. I mean, all these people are nice. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, but it's unsustainable. You can't just support, support a whole army of people you know, by yourself there, at least not really anymore. And again, the large office, this is just a standard office picture. You know, you're seeing all these patients you need a big office. You need lots of rooms. And it's like a lot of these people aren't necessarily value added to the doctor patient relationship. Again, nice people, but coders, billers, you know, extra reception. It just, it, it, you can't, so, you know, so you can't control your costs and we also can't control how much you get paid. So insurance likes to decrease reimbursements for physicians year after year. Medicare usually Trent starts it and then United Healthcare or the other uh, insurances follow. United Healthcare has been mentioned recently because they've been forcing these unilateral contract agreements, cutting people's fees actually below Medicare. But anyways, the point is, is it creates the squeeze. Your overhead goes up, your reimbursements go down, and your whole practice becomes unsustainable despite you working your butt off. And that's when hospital and private equity comes in, which I'm not going to get into, but is really a whole different topic in itself. So this is why insurance free works. So at its core, it's minimal overhead. So you have minimal, you can even have no staff and that's how I started and that's how other people who do this model start. Um, small or no office space and I'm gonna get into that in a second, but I don't have an office. The startup costs are absolutely minimal. You need like a medical license, malpractice in most states, I have it. And then a few other like smart, like, you know, website, that sort of thing. But I think I spent $7,000 about four or five years ago. But I mean, it really doesn't cost a lot. And I think in the beginning, I was paying like $800 a month for a total cost of running my business. It's probably more like $2,000 now because I've expanded. But um, yeah, I mean, you, you cut your costs down so low. So you end up not having to see so many people. It actually is a low volume model. You spend longer with patients. I book my appointments for an hour. So you have a low volume, low overhead model. But it doesn't mean it's low rev. It doesn't mean it's low profit. I mean, you can have good revenue from this, especially you have high revenue for time worked. So you'll find out that you actually will make more money per hour, and you'll be much happier, and your patients will be happier. But sometimes people erroneously think that it's like low volume, low overhead, and then just there's no money there, and that just there, there's just so many parasites in the system taking money out that I think when you actually remove them and see your actual value of, of, of what you can create when when nobody's taken got a hand in the pot, it's it's really crazy. But again, you'll be much happier. You have more time. The most important thing is no one's telling you what to do. You can practice medicine how you want. There's no prior authorizations. There's no insurance nonsense. There's no administrative junk. I mean, I can't tell you how nice it is. And if this is you like on the treadmill running there, you know, in the, in the suit running full speed, I mean, it's just not sustainable. I mean, how long can you do that? I don't think the shelf life on, on docs is 30 plus years anymore. I, I think we're probably at least half that because practicing is, is, is just like becoming untenable. So I promised three secrets, right? So secret number one, I don't pay for office space. Some of you are probably saying like, how the heck does he do that? So this is how it works. Now I didn't start out to do this, but this is what happened. So I'm mobile, which means I'm fully self-contained. I carry around a bag. I can do everything that you would normally do in an orthopedic office, um, except take x-rays, but you know, we care, but like in my bag. So like suturing, casting, splinting, whatever you need. So what I found is that in the community, I met certain people let's say a chiropractor who would say, hey, this guy is shoulder pain. Can you come see him at my office? And what that does is it does two things. One is the chiropractor or whoever it is, primary care doc can say, hey, I have an orthopedic surgeon who's essentially on call who will come here whenever I need him and he'll see you. So we have orthopedic services here, even though they don't have it full time. And if I'm seeing them at their office, it makes it so they're not worried about them leaving and going somewhere else and never coming back. So the value add is tremendous. And like the resources I'm using are literally just that room. I'm self-contained. I'm not using their staff. I'm not using their EMR. I'm not even using their supplies. And when I leave the room, I clean it and you would never know I'm there. So the footprint is really minimal. And what I found is that there are certain people in the community who really value this and, and value having like an orthodox kind of on call. And um, 
that's how I don't pay for offices. So I have like four or five places that I go and I still do house calls as well. And probably mostly office visits, but again, it's still mobile, even though I'm not in someone's house. But again, if they all told me to go screw myself, I would just go back to house calls again or buy a commercial space. That's another option you can do if that's kind of where you are. But a lot of people don't think this will work. But if you think about it in the sense of taking call, like you would take call for a hospital, I mean, that's a huge value add for some of these offices that can basically say they have an orthopedic doc or any other sort of doc, like sports medicine doc, who will just come whenever they call them. I mean, with a minimal footprint. So unless you're in a place like New York City where it could be tough, people will probably be minimal. I mean, you can use the offices during lunchtime and their patients like it. I mean, they get it like a one-stop shop. So that's how I don't really pay for office space. And uh, the relationships I have with these people who, who are paying for the office space are very good. But if you do it right, you can certainly do it like that. And it's worked well for me. Like I said, you'll be immediately happier. This is a map from a website called DPC Frontier. So family medicine docs essentially hit the pain point a lot earlier than a specialty docs. And they had to figure something else out. So they figured out, figured out direct primary care. And that's a tried and true model. Like I said, they're so much farther ahead of us. And all these green dots represent direct primary care practices. So you can see people, this is a real movement. People are really doing this. And if any, and I'll get to this later again, but it's it's not it's not nothing. It, it's growing. So a little bit of history. In the 1930s, 40% 40, 40 of all visits, like all of them, were house calls. And the doc would have a simple office with one staff member who is usually their spouse. And as insurance got involved, that all kind of fell apart. But Honestly, at its core, it's a very durable model. And like, um, if you have low volume days with this model, like it's fine. I mean, I have them. Some days I'm not doing a lot or I do some medical legal work. You know, Dr. Mate has them, who I talked about earlier. And we're both still doing well. So the model is extremely durable. You don't have this monster overhead you're paying for. So like when COVID happened, even though I was just starting up, I was really not affected too much because I don't have these monster costs that, that I have to pay for. But the model still works. There's no reason that model can't work. Um, once you leave hospitals and insurance is behind, it works. It's just instead of, you know, the old timey picture here of the doc and whatnot. I mean, you have modern technology, right? So my forms are on an iPad. I carry around an ultrasound, the butterfly IQ with me. Um, you know, I can load up images and everything like that. You know, they have my phone number. They can text and call me and everything's all electronic. So it's a modern twist, but that model worked for a long time until insurance got ruined and it, and it still works in its own weird way, surprisingly. All right. And one thing I want to say is that you don't need business experience to do this. Some of you may be saying, well, I don't have an MBA. I've never done this before. None of us do. I mean, we all just kind of started and figured it out. Um, and a lot of us don't have an MBA or don't really want one. As a quick aside, you know, for small businesses like this, I don't think you really need it. Um, so I, I'm, I, I wouldn't want one, but you know, if you have one, that's great. Um, but the complications of running a medical practice, once insurance is removed, the complications are removed with it. And what you have is a boiled down and simple model that you can run pretty easily, especially if your staff is just you and somebody else. I mean, this is, this is you, you are, if you've made it through medical school and all that, I mean, you're very intelligent, you're very capable. If you donate, if you put a little bit of time and effort towards this, you'll, you'll be successful with it. You don't need to be a business genius. Most of it's common sense. So this comes to secret number two. People ask me about my EMR. So what do I use? Well, I'm not billing insurance, right? So I don't need one of those big clunky Epic EMRs, right? I mean, they're very expensive and those are billing machines. That's why they're so expensive. The AMA makes two thirds of its money from leasing out CPT codes. So the EMRs have to pay for these CPT codes and it becomes a stupid, giant, worthless nodes, click box mess. You don't need that with this model, but you need something HIPAA compliant. So I just use a plain old Google workspace and um, you sign a business agreement and it makes everything in there all, you know, Gmail drive. It's all becomes HIPAA compliant. I pay for the, I pay for the business plus because they have something called the vault, which makes it so even if all my files get deleted, they're still saved in this vault. Um, and I have two users. So you're talking $36 a month um, is what I pay for this. And, and I find it works really well. I can generate PDFs and send them to patients. Um, like I, each patient has their own folder. I can do notes and orders. This is a little picture of um, kind of what I use my template gallery with my, you know, it looks professional. You put your logo on it. It looks great and it can do basically everything. Um, it's also mobile compatible. So you can look at it from your phone. If you need to look up a chart, it's super easy. And remember using Google, 
Google tools are made to work for gigantic businesses. So they have no problem handling your small business. Um, you can also keep your business documents on that. And it, it's, it's very secure. Um, it's probably better than the EMR using because it's, you know, you can create it how you want and it, it's built for note taking. Um, and this is an example of one of my notes where that's just what it looks like. And I have dot phrases and everything. It just would be like, it, it's what we've all wanted in an EMR, which is basically just the way to type a note that's readable that you can look at later and is secure and that you can send out without all the insurance billing junk. Some things it can't do. So it can't e-prescribe. Um, so I always have to call in scripts or write them, which isn't a big deal for me. It can't bill insurance. Again, built perfectly not to do this. It will not work in that way. And there's no facts. I mean, I don't want to spend the whole time talking about how much I hate the fax machine, but I, I really hate it. Um, I refuse to fax anything. You, if, you, if you need to fax something to me, you can just email it. If you can't do that, you can snail mail it. If you can't do that, it must not be important um so because i won't i won't get a fax anyway sorry i'm not going to spend all the time talking about how much i hate faxes i hate them a lot all right um so another thing is what you'll find with this model is if you talk to someone they'll say that won't work you know you're just seeing healthy and wealthy people and like i just cannot express how untrue that is there are so many people who have no insurance or their deductible is sky high where they essentially are functionally uninsured meaning that they couldn't pay to, you know, they can't afford, they don't have that much money lying around. So if you're in direct care and you're specialty, you're usually the most economic option. And these people don't know where to go because there's no transparency. I'll give you an example was I had a guy fix his distal radius a while ago. And I think it was like at the time, maybe $6,500 all in, which is pretty good. It might be a little more now, but the hospital was going to charge him $27,000 for just the physician's fee. And so what this guy was going to do is just leave himself with a broken wrist and let it heal all, all messed up because he didn't know where to go. Luckily, he was able to find me and we were able to work it out. But, you know, there's so many stories like that or someone who wants to get an injection. They want to charge them $1,000 per injection, you know, or something crazy. But these patients don't have insurance. Their deductible's too high. They're scared to use it. They want transparency and they don't know where to go. And this population is growing. So that is most of the patient population I see. Do I get some very like wealthy people? Sometimes I do who like the convenience of me traveling, but that's a minority of what I do, at least where I live. Um, so that is a huge fallacy with this. You, there's a group of people who really want these sort of services. And it's not just individual patients. There's also companies who are suffering, at least financially. So every year insurance premiums are go up and sometimes double digits a year. And the brokers that sell these insurance plans, they get a percentage of the premium. So when the uh, premiums go up double digits, they say, well, I'm sorry, I, I prevented it from going up further. And then they're making so much money off that. So what these companies are seeing is that healthcare is becoming unaffordable. So they go self-funded, meaning that they pay out of pocket for everything. And they have a stopgap insurance, meaning that if it goes too high, they have insurance for that. So some of these companies are actually paying for all the care. So I've done surgeries this way and I've seen patients this way. So I mean, that is a whole other subset that's coming to light. And, you know, the, these companies are willing to pay for more big ticket items. And for the patient, it's actually a better experience because they don't have any deductible or copay. And they're able to see you and everybody's happy, you know, except for the insurance companies who hospitals who have been removed from it. But, you know, I think it's time that they suffer some unhappiness, to be honest with you. Um, and again, one of my favorites, it wouldn't work in my area. Again, look at this map of primary care docs. And they're just everywhere. So usually when somebody says that they have no experience in direct care, they don't understand it. And strangely, sometimes they get offended by it or mad about it because if they know that another model exists where they don't have to be suffering so much practicing, it, it, it bothers them to think that they're not doing that. So they just say that won't work. The only way for me to do it is to keep suffering in the system. But you really don't have to. It will work in your area. These are real practices. And they're waiting for you to open up your practice. In the meantime, the longer you stay in the system, it's not only you, but your patients are also languishing in there as well. We can talk about seven minutes of FaceTime, disgruntled patients, hard to do good medical care in those short periods of time. But I mean, the longer you stay in there, the longer you're just going to languish. This brings us to secret three. So insurance free doesn't just mean cash pay. That is certainly a part, a good chunk of what I do, but it's anything where you don't have to interact with an insurance company. That's the definition of it. So it's, you, you were built specifically not to interact with an insurance company. You don't have the staff. You don't have the resources. You're incompatible with contacting them or working with them in any way. 
So while it's cash pay, it's also some other things too. So there's certain things that insurance just won't pay for. So these can be larger markets because, because they'll include people who do have insurance. You're talking your PRP injections, regenerative medicine, aesthetics, medical legal work. I mean, this is stuff that people have to pay cash for. So, and then there's some things that insurance are kind of involved in, but you don't have to interact with them. And that's more like personal injury. You'll have to interact with a lawyer. Sorry, um, I do a fair amount of that. But the idea is that you're not just saying, I only take cash. You find what kind of works for you in the realm of outside of insurance medicine and kind of smush it all together. So you combine a few of those together. Like me, I'll do cash, medical, legal work, personal injury, some regenerative. I don't do aesthetics. I, I never learned that. It's not my thing. That's not what I do. But if you do, that's that's great. But the idea is that you're you're, you're using you're putting a lot of them together. You're not just um, you're not just taking one, and, and that that's what will get you a viable practice. Because I'll have times where I'm doing more cash pay, and then times where I'm doing more personal injury, or I'll have a medical legal week. Um, as long as you don't violate your own moral compass, like if you don't believe in any of that stuff, then certainly, and you hate lawyers, like don't do personal injury, don't do medical legal work. Find what sort of works for you and what you think. Um, you're okay doing and you like to do, uh, at least on some level. And um, you'll kind of develop your own brand of what you do and, and how you practice. So that's my advice there. It's not just cash. It's a bunch of other things as well. All righty. So secret four, well, you're saying, wait a second. He just told me about three secrets. Well, secret four isn't really a secret. There's just 36 secrets, which obviously I don't have time to go into or even in depth. So if it's okay with you guys, I want to talk a little bit about this course I put together. I'll wait for you guys to kind of take it all home and, and get some uh, CME credits. I'm not going to belabor it too much. but um, So again, people were asking me for it, so we decided to make it. I partnered with Omar, so we're able to get 35 um, AMA PRA Category 1 CME credits. I live in Colorado, so I don't need any CME, but most people are in CME states, so you do need it. And this covers essentially everything that I've learned building this practice and the things I wish I knew. Like any everything from how to be mobile to how to make intake forms to how do you build a website, not overpaying for equipment and SEO, networking, marketing. All, I, I tried to cover everything I could possibly think of that I do regularly. Um, again, this is through my trial and error in building this practice. Uh, you know, the idea is that I make mistakes so, so you don't have to make those same mistakes. And I don't think you're going to find this collection of knowledge anywhere else because there's not too many people who are doing this. If you can, please let me know so I can... I can talk to them, but um, I think it's kind of a unique, you know, collection of, of stuff, of, of information. You know, it's not like I'm selling a real estate, I'm not putting a real estate course out where there's like, you know, an ungodly amount. So with this model, things that you don't need. So one, that's out expensive EMR, probably $1,000 a month. You're looking at $12,000 a year, at least that you're spending on your EMR. I'm being conservative here. Also things you don't need, an office. <laughs> if you do it like I do it. So $5,000 a month, again, probably I'm being relatively conservative, $60,000 a year. But the biggest thing you don't need this model is staff. You're talking $50,000 per year per employee. Again, if a ratio of five to one, I mean, you're talking at least $200,000 a year, you're probably not spending on staff. And again, I'm trying to be conservative as I can, you know, in, in these calculations. So the total cost of things that you really don't need with this model, you're looking at least $300,000 a year, probably in things that you just don't need. Um, so let me just talk about this course real quick. So it's 36 videos. We have 35 AMA credits. Um, you have this webinar course. Normally it's 3297. You get about a thousand dollars of value just right off the bat for your AMA credits. I mean, in a lot of states, that's supposed no, uh, basically a year's worth of credit. So if you're gonna do them on something, you might as well do them on something. You're gonna learn something that's useful to you. Um, but with the webinar code, we're doing it for 2274. And then also that it gets you access to a private uh, LinkedIn group where everyone can kind of bounce ideas off each other. So I don't want to take up too much of your time. So that brings us to the Q&A. I left the website. So if you want to access it, you can go to insurancefreemedicalpractice.com. And the code is webinar promo, which will knock a, a chunk of money off that. Um, all right. I guess now we can have time for questions, which, which I'm sure we have some uh, about this kind of model. Great presentation, Dr. Paul. That was fantastic. And um, yeah, just so just to remind people again, if you want to check out the website, uh, go to insurancefreemedicalpractice.com. Use the code webinar promo. Uh, just this is just for this webinar. You get a thousand dollars off. And again, yeah, you get 35 CME credits. So that by itself kind of takes care of it. But yeah, we have a lot of great questions and comments. Um, I'm going to start from the very top. 
we kind of breeze through as many of these as possible. So Marty says, in hindsight, would you have finished your fellowship? Also, any recommendations for classes or learning experiences you would have gotten during your education looking back? So for the fellowship thing, in hindsight, I don't think so. I mean, with this model, I think the more general you can be, the better off you are. I mean, that doesn't mean you need to operate on everything. You can still operate on only the things you want to operate on. But I'm seeing like spines, again, not operating on spines, knees, hips, ankles. I see all of it. And I think that's helped me grow rather than just doing like upper extremities. So I don't think it would have been useful from that um, perspective. As far as resources, I've been honestly – it's basically finding somebody who's done it and just seeing what they do, I think is the most useful thing. As far as the education for me, I, I read a lot of, I, I'm a big book reader. So a lot of books on like behavioral psychology, I think are super helpful to kind of figure out, you know, if you can predict why someone's doing what they do, it'll help you with business. I think a lot. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think, I think um, for the most part, even though I like, I do read business books, um, the best books that have like sharpened my business acumen are books on psychology, microeconomics, mathematics, uh, game theory. Right. Um, and like, you know, shameless plug, like the courses are actually really damn good. And what I liked about the course, Dr. Paul is that it, it's a pretty, it, you, you did a really good job distilling a very complicated thing into like something that's at least when I went through the videos, cause if I was going to endorse somebody, something, I want to make sure that it's good. Like I can get through that in a weekend. Um, and it kind of, addresses a lot of these topics you know um so good good question uh uh, uh marty uh we got dr lou next dr lou wants to know how do you decide price points for your services pricing is a really interesting thing in business we can spend like a whole hour talking about that but dr paul how did you decide price points gotcha yeah i think i made a whole video on that so price points doctors make the mistake a lot of pricing things too low we always underprice ourselves. So if you're offering your service for like 50 bucks or something, like people aren't going to use it. It's too low. If you do it higher, they won't do it as well. So the best way to do it is to find comps of people doing it in your area um, of what you're doing. Like let's say for regenerative PRP shot. If you can't find those, you honest to God, just have to make it up and then you can move it up or down. The nice thing about running a practice like this is you can always change your prices. Um, so I started a little lower and over time I've moved it up to kind of, what's accurate. If I do something and I'm like, you know, I had this story one time where I was traveling. I used to have travel fees and I drove all the way out to West Cliff, which it's really out in the boonies. I'm driving six miles on like dirt roads, no GPS. I think I only charged like $200 for the extra travel. And it took like my whole day. And I'm like, all right, I messed up there. So I came back and reworked that whole travel fee schedule. So I never had to do that again. Um, but you know, some, there's some trial and error involved as well, for sure. Yeah. And just, just from my, I'm, I want to just share from my perspective as like a patient, um, you know, myself, there's other people I know, whether they're entrepreneurs or, you know, they're just W2 employees that I, I think for the most part, if you make more than 50 K a year, there's a lot of people who are willing to pay out of pocket for things, mainly just for time. You know, I can't tell you there's been plenty of times where I paid extra money myself to see a clinician or a specialist or something because, the other option of going through my insurance is either it's either going to take too much time or is like too far away or highly inconvenient. And, you know, more and more people are doing this. I mean, there's a mastermind group that I'm a part of where there's like a lot of like guys in their like early twenties and stuff. And I've seen these guys that they've like paid more money to have uh, physicians come directly to their house for, for checkups. One guy um, had an x-ray, a mobile, uh, mobile uh, 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 x-ray machine uh, brought to the house. So, People are, you know, you'd be surprised what people are willing to pay if it means that they get their time back and they don't have the hassle or inconvenience of going to a clinic. Yeah, for sure. I get people all the time, hey, I'm going on vacation. I can't get in anywhere. And they do have insurance. And again, I'm like the most reasonable option. So they find me and, you know, we try to make them feel as good as we can. Exactly. Um, Christopher V, uh, he has two questions, but I'm going to go with one of them. One, I don't know, maybe he was commenting on something, but he said Google Workspace. I don't know. Do you know what that is? Yeah, Google yeah. Workspace is what my EMR is based off of. Basically, you sign up for a Google Workspace account. You figure out what level you want to use, and, that, and then you sign a business agreement, and that makes the whole thing HIPAA compliant. And then within that, you're basically, your EMR is basically a, a HIPAA compliant Google Drive, and you can kind of create your old Word, Word template documents and save them as PDFs and send them out when you need. And I've been doing that for years, and like, it's really wonderful, and it works on your phone. Like, If I have to look up a patient chart and I'm out, I can easily do it. You can save images on there. I mean, it's it's a Google Drive. You can really put whatever you want on there, even videos. 
I mean, I used to record some visits when I was out and about, if I was doing something that, you know, like let's say an injection or something or, and, um, I would load those up as well. Perfect. Um, I'm going to come back to Christopher's other questions in a second. He has a few more really good ones. So Christopher, I'm going to come back to this, but just to get other people, uh, we have Steve Meadows who says, uh, Dr. Meadows says, please address fractures, x-rays and surgery. Sure. So, um, as far as surgery is concerned, when you're working with cash pay, um, if you have a business who's self-funded, they're, they're a little more flexible as far as what you can do. Um, if you have cash pay patients, it, I tend to find the sweet spot to be in a procedure room. And the reason is because I can do things under local and cut my costs down a lot. And it tends to be a nice sweet spot where it's affordable for them. And then I also do well, like let's say a carpal tunnel is $3,000. I'll pay the procedure room a thousand dollars to use it. And I keep 2000, which is more than most people make on a joint replacement. Um, so that's a nice sweet spot. As far as fractures are concerned, if some, look, if it's a bad fracture, like they fractured their femur or their dislocated ankle, they're not coming to me. They're going to the emergency room. And if they go to the emergency room, I can get images. If not, I'll have them get images, x-rays before I see them. Um, I have done a mobile x-ray before. There's uh, that one that does it in my area. But honestly, by the time a lot of people come to me, they already have x-rays and MRIs and everything. So I'm able to look everything up before I see them. I take pictures of the, the images that make sense. Um, fractures, again, you're getting mostly, you're getting more non-op fractures. You're not getting sort of your mangled extremities that you're used to. I will say though, that as far as doing trauma with a cash pay practice, it's tough because I, I've seen patients before displaced all that, like, Hey, and like guy in his twenties, like, like you need surgery. He's like, nah, I'm just going to let the vibes heal it. So you get a lot of people that will really balk at doing it or they come to you when it's too late, when it's been like weeks and weeks. So a lot more casting definitely more of a frustrating population uh, to deal with when you don't have that in-system stuff. So again, with these models, it, the patient population shifts, the type of people you see shifts. So it's practicing medicine in sort of a di the same, same standards of care, but you, the way you're doing it is a little bit different. The patient population C is a little different. Perfect. Perfect. Great question. Uh, next one, Dr. Rosenbaum, we got a lot of questions. So everybody like, Keep bringing on questions again. You know, Dr. Paul is happy to answer them. Um, all right. Dr. Rosenbaum, uh, how and where do you operate and what do you do about implant costs? That's actually, that's a really good question. So again, yeah, I mean, I've moved from surgery center to a procedure room with implant costs. You can just get cash pricing and bundle it in. And then you would charge the patient one total cost. And then what I used to do is I would pay the anesthesia, I'd pay the facility, I'd pay the anesthesia, I'd pay the implant costs. Basically, I would just pay everybody out and then I would charge the patient and then I would keep the difference. Um, but you can certainly negotiate that. Um, it's just one of those factors that's bundled in. Perfect. All right. Let's see. Uh, Dr. Rafi. Dr. Rafi asks, is there a way to start a cash-based practice while still participating in Medicare at all so I can keep participating as a hospice director or have other income streams while building up a cash-based practice? I like the way this guy thinks. Sure. So if you stay within Medicare, and I'm opted out of Medicare, you cannot legally see a Medicare patient and charge them cash. So you can be opted into Medicare and you can run a cash practice, but you cannot see Medicare patients at all. Um even if you have them sign something saying like, Hey, you know, you're going to pay me cash. You can't do that. So you can stay in Medicare. You continue working as a hospitalist on the other side, you build cash pay, uh, kind of a cash pay world. The only, uh, the difference is if it's a non covered service, like let's say a PRP injection that they won't pay for. I believe you can charge a Medicare patient that even if you've not opted out, cause it's an uncovered service for Medicaid. It depends on the state where I'm from. I can't see Medicaid patients like at all. There's no opting out, even though I'm not part of Medicaid. I cannot see a medic, you know, it was Medicaid patients. A lot of them aren't well off, but some of them are actually pretty wealthy. They just don't have income and they happen to be on Medicaid. So that's just, that's state dependent, but you do get some of those. It sounds like the best, best thing is just kind of have a separation of those two things. So your cash based practice, you run it, market it, et cetera, as cash base. You don't talk about insurance at all. Yeah. You can't mix them. When you start mixing business models, you've got real problems. I mean, it, it, the, the, the more resource intensive model, will uh take over so in the world of insurance that's using up all your resources it's going to crowd out the cash-based model so if you do have if you're trying to do some sort of hybrid practice you really need an autonomous business unit to do cash and maybe if you have a lot of staff 
maybe even a fully dedicated staff member that only does that. Otherwise, your office staff is going to get call people calling about cash and they're just going to be like, I don't know, we don't do that and hang up the phone. That, that's really not what you want. Yeah, good point. Good point. Uh, uh, Dr. Ozude says, are you charging for post-operative follow-up or for cases that have complications or is it included with the bundle? I generally include the post-operative with the bundle, like even sometimes the pre-op. Well, if they, the, the pre-op cost of the, uh, will go toward like the cost of the visit for pre-operative, if they do get surgery, will go towards the surgery. So if I think it's necessary, it will incentivize them. I haven't, like, again, I'm, I'm doing fairly simply simple cases. So I really, you know, I'm not operating nearly as much as I used to. So I haven't had like a situation where I've had to take somebody back in. Um, but there's other ways to do that. I've heard of getting, you know, that's a tougher one to solve. I haven't encountered that problem yet. You could bundle it in or, you know, you could discount it if that happens to happen. I mean, if I, I, I have had before where I, let's say I've given someone an injection, they have a lot of pain and I got to see them, I won't charge them. But I've done that probably less than, you know, I can count on one hand how many times that's happened. Great question. Great question. And somebody sent me a private message. So just, just to let people know the uh, course that Dr. Paul offers. So again, go to insurancefreemedicalpractice.com. Uh, that webinar code, it's only valid for a few days. Um, so the code is webinar promo. You're going to get a thousand dollars off. And so the course ends up being, uh, what was the amount again, Dr. Paul? It was, uh, we had, uh, it's, uh, 2274, 2274. And, and along with that course, just so you know, there is a private group that Dr. Paul put together. So that way people can connect with each other and and also get to directly connect, connected and ask questions of Dr. Paul. I think it, just in my, I'm not a physician, but I do run my own business and everything. One thing I recommend for all entrepreneurs is that it, it really helps a lot when you're in a peer group, um, just for support, to, to share ideas and everything. I really under, underestimated the value of that. And I've been in one myself for over a year now. It's just, I, it's really fantastic. Um, okay, Dr. Dr. Milani um, has a question. She says, saw on your website that you partner with reimbursify. What percent of your patients get reimbursed through reimbursify? Oh, it's so low. I mean, honest to God, it's so low. I maybe only had one person use it. Most of the time, if they want, I'll give them a super bill and like I'll email that to them. And then I don't really know what happens from there. Um, you can do that. But a lot of times the people come into you, they don't have insurance or deductibles high. They don't, they're not really interested in that occasionally you'll get somebody with good insurance who wants to go through all the effort. And a lot of people, I mean, filing insurance claims, as we all know, like really sucks. So a lot of people just don't even want to deal with it. So yeah, I really have not had that many people use it at all. It's um, funny you say that. I, I got a super bill for something earlier this year. I still haven't filed it because I just like, I just really, it's just not a good use of my time. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So I find that people don't really do it, but it does exist. So that's a company to help them do that if they would like. Um, but I, I don't really lean too heavily into that. I mean, the whole point of the practice is I don't interact with insurance companies. I mean, at all, I won't do prior authorizations and I'm not contractually obligated to nothing. So I give them, they're, they're, they know in advance, I give them the super bill. They know that they may not get any money out of that, but that's not my fault. Blame your insurance company, not me. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Fury has a great question. Do you have patients pay before or after a visit? And what if an injection is acted at it? Great question, exactly. Dr. Paul. Answer. I, I got some thoughts on this, but I want Dr. Paul to take this first, and then I have I have a business model uh, suggestion for this. Gotcha. So what I started doing, I didn't used to do this, but I do now. I charge a deposit. So I think my, my visits right now are like $375, which includes one injection if it's cash paid. you know. So I'll charge them 40 bucks. If they don't want to pay 40 bucks, which is essentially one-tenth of the visit, then they're not going to want to pay for the visit. So what that did... Is that cut down? Because I had one day one time where I had a whole ton of people scheduled and they like all canceled. I had nothing to do. So you want to stop the people who just are looking for a placeholder. Maybe they want to go somewhere else. Maybe they're not sure they want to do it. The deposit really stops a lot of those people. They'll tell you they need to think about it, which is good, right? You want them to think about it. Or they got to go to their car to get their credit card. No one keeps their credit card in their car. I hope not at least. So they'll, they'll never call you back. Surgery is $1,500 deposit. Um, these are non-refundable, by the way, because that you really don't, it's such a pain in the butt. You know, you really don't want someone flaking out on you for that. So you kind of force people in a certain sense to, to pay that. And that'll cut down on your wasted time because you will get people who will flake out on you. And if they need to reschedule, I make them pay the full cost. So you can still keep the deposit, 
but you got to pay the full cost. If I need to order x-rays in advance, you got to pay the full cost of the visit because I used to order x-rays on people and they would never get them and disappear and I wasted my time. So over time, we've set up all these processes. But essentially, if you make them pay a little bit before they schedule, you know, and you know, they, they know you charge for no-shows and they think you might have their credit card, you know, even though we don't keep it, uh, that'll cut down on, on, on all the people wasting your time. Yeah. And something, something I was going to, uh, suggest, uh, I think this is an area, whether you take insurance or not, that physicians lose so much money, so much money. So just my two suggestions, I think taking deposit is a great idea. Get a credit card on file. Like that's like one of the easiest things to do. And I go to physicians, physician offices all the time just for myself. And this is just such an easy thing. And the last thing I was going to say is look, we're in 2023. There are so many different payment processors. A lot of doctors, again, no offense. A lot of doctors think too cheap. I think it's important to be frugal in some areas, but in other areas, it's like, okay, do you want to, do you want to have a payment processor like Stripe or PayPal or something where, yeah, you're going to, you're going to pay like two or 3%, but then you have a way to get a patient to pay versus right. I'll use myself as an example. I've gotten medical bills from physician practices and I'm like, where do I pay? I have to pick up the phone and call them. And guess what happens? I forget. Yeah. You, and so, 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 so that, that net 30, 60, 90 kills you. <laughs> you you want to make it as easy as possible for someone to pay you, right? If you take 3% on the credit card, who cares? You just want them to pay you. You do not want to make it hard for people to pay you in any sort of way because of what Omar just said. So, you know, if the, for those who aren't familiar, if you charge someone a credit card, you're going to lose 3% of whatever it is that you charged. But that's just the cost of doing business. Otherwise, they'll forget to pay you. They won't pay you. You know, you really don't want to deal with that. Exactly. That's exactly right. And, you know, these these like I personally use Stripe for a lot of things. I, I like it a lot. There's a lot of value in, in like if you use Stripe for everything, Stripe can give you like really good loans. There's a lot of there's a lot of value in it. Anyways. There's so many of them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've got Stripe for one. I use Chase Card Reader for another. I mean, you know, it, it's easy peasy. I think, and I think one of the things I like about, about your course, Dr. Paul is like, you're very, like I, you keep your biz, your operating costs and expenses really, really low, but for the things that are worth paying some extra money for you do it, but everything else is just like, don't pay for this. Don't pay for that. But there's certain things where it's like, yeah, like that's just the cost of doing business. Um, Dr. Ozude has another question. How do you do the self-funded employers? Uh, how do the self-funded employers find your services or do you market to them? So this is so finding self-funded employers is hard because the way I've been lucky with it was there's a primary care doc who takes care of a giant office sort of near where I, where, where I am and she'll send all the ortho to me and the business will essentially pay all the ortho, including surgeries. But that was sort of luck. There's companies like Coral, I think is one. And there's other of these companies that will go around basically collecting all these self-funded programs, but it's a tough market right now. A lot of them are attached to direct primary care doctors. Who are taking care of them so your best bet if for if, is to find primary care direct primary care doctors offices who, who work with self-funded businesses and try to offer you know larger ticket items a way for them to pay for it um that's probably your best way in as opposed to you just going straight for it or to use a platform like coral i've really not had good luck with coral but i think surgery center of oklahoma gets like 40 percent of their business from it Again, my ticket items are smaller, doing things in procedure rooms under local at the moment. But if you do bigger things like joint replacements and spine, you'll probably attract more. You'll probably attract more business because they're the big ticket items are where, where everybody's losing a lot of money. Perfect. Um, Chris, Doctor Christopher had this uh, one point. Um, why why not use Doximity for your fax needs? I hate the fax machine, man. I refuse to use it. I just it's a personal I'm thing. With, I'm with you. I just hate it so much. I mean, it's 2023. Like, oh, you can get an electronic fax. It's like, yeah, you can also email it. And, and fax isn't even really that secure. Everyone thinks it is. Legally, for HIPAA purposes, what you're supposed to do is when someone sends a fax, they're supposed to send you a code that you put in on your end to get the fax. But nobody does that. So the whole thing of it being more secure is a farce. But honestly, everybody I work with, like, I think I have one doc who snails mails me all his, all his notes. But everyone, everyone basically, if, if they're wanting my business, like, they have to comply with my systems. So I haven't had a problem. I, and also an important thing is like for radiology, I have access to like everywhere in town online system. So I can check images from almost everywhere, which, which is huge for what I do. 
Perfect. Yeah, and I think this is uh, like sort of a theme here. You you said it earlier, but it's because of this model, um, you get to decide who you do business with, and then people have to do business on your terms. And I think that's 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 really important. You know. Yeah, I mean, they have to comply with my systems, right? I don't do prior authorizations. I can get someone an MRI same day, five hundred dollars. I've had that before. I've ordered it in the morning. I see him midday. I order it, and I get the report that night. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing how fast these things can go when they pay cash, which is less than what they might pay with their deductible, anyways. Um, I yeah. tell the story one time of this one lady who um, she had neck pain. I ordered an MRI of her neck, and um, I, her insurance calls me for prior authorization and. They call me and they say, we're collecting some information for prior auth. And I go, oh, uh, I don't believe in those. <laughs> and she didn't even know what to say. It was just silence. And I'm like, yeah. She's like, I think it's for your patient. I'm like, I'm sure it is. But if you deny it, that's on you. That's not on me. I called the patient. I said, hey, I think they're going to deny your MRI. And she called and she gave them hell and they approved it. And I didn't have to do anything. Now, that's not a, I would not recommend that if you're in system. I think you are contractually obligated to do them. But I'm not. I refuse to do them. I mean, this is the thing about your own model and business. You can decide what you want to do or not want to do. All these things that we're used to doing with insurance, I mean, a lot of them are just bullshit. You, you don't need to do them. They don't add anything uh, to the patient. So I refuse to do them uh, unless it helps the patient. Well, in that case, the insurance company's taking the blame, not me. I wanted to shine light on, you know, the good insurance you think you have isn't really good. Facts. <laughs> I, Facts. I love it. Um, Dr. Paul, there's uh, we we do have other questions, uh, so people get get your questions in now. There's a few physicians who could not attend live, and so they send me a um, a question. So I'm just going to bring it up. So one of them was uh, Dr. Obitello. He wanted to know uh, when does the course start and end. I mean, we can both answer that, but essentially the the course is an on demand course. You can you take it anytime. But maybe you can talk a little bit more about the course here. Yeah, we just we it's up now. We just put it up. We've been excited about it. And working hard on it for a while um but it's up and it's online and um you have this promo that you can use so it, it's not like we're not it's not going to disappear or anything you know it, it's going to be up there but it's it's up now so you could you could look at it if you wanted to and you were really motivated you could start it tonight uh perfect another question dr bueller asks like how do i convert my current practice over so converting your current practice over this is where a lot of people might find themselves the first thing you want to do is create an autonomous business unit that takes cash. If you tell your existing staff, hey, we're doing cash now, they're just going to ignore it. It's going to be another thing. They're already overburdened. You got to find one person or one thing that can just only focus on that. That'll and keep it separate from everybody else. That'll let it survive. Um, and then you want to build your system practices to that. So also what you want to do is look at all your insurance plans. Maybe there's a plan that makes you, you know, requires always gives you a hard time it requires tons of resources and pays the least well start by cutting that one plan out at the same time start building cash based cash based things like you know um cash based visits regenerative medicine personal injury whatever it is you do and over time add some more of this take out another insurance and keep going and going and then at some point you'll have to downsize your office and staff and then or just break off on your own if you're part of a group until you get to that last medicare contract right the hardest one to cut once you cut all of them, that's when you gain the most uh, savings and that when you're really released. So that is that is what I would say uh, is the process. But in the meantime, create an autonomous like business unit inside your business that just does cash and with a dedicated person and dedicated system processes. Perfect. Perfect. Um, oh, we got a few more, few more questions. Let me pull them up. Really, really enjoying the questions tonight. Um, so we got, uh, let me go to Dr. Ishibashi. Uh, can you touch a little bit more on surgery? When you mentioned you doing a distal radius uh, or if, was this done in a procedure room under local Mac uh, with anesthesiologists? I guess I'm trying to figure out if this business model will work for practice that does a lot of surgery like scopes, fractures, low energy trauma, et cetera. No, this was in a surgery center. I've since moved sort of my, my practice away from there because they were hard to negotiate with. So sometimes the price would be reasonable. One time they wanted to charge me 4,500 facility for a trigger. So I found with the procedure room, it just simplified it. So no, that was with anesthesia. They were under, if you have an existing facility, like I said, with the autonomous business unit, you can still do it. It'll still function. Um, it's the same surgery that you'd be doing. And this is all just the economics, getting it actually done. Um, but Honestly, 
with this system of direct care, the value proposition of an ortho doc or other docs is different than it would be in system in the sense of if you look at a direct primary care doctor, they don't do exactly what a family med doc does in the system. So that's part of my journey is figuring that out. And people, it tends to be more conservative treatment, tends to be more injections, at least the way that I'm doing it. So it's not like all of a sudden you convert it and you're still operating the same amount. Like that could vary. Some people are able to do that. That's a hard thing to do. It has been done. But honestly, it'll probably shift a little bit. I mean, you'll be happier, but you might be oper you'll be working less too, which maybe is part of being happier. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, a few more questions. Uh, Dr. Tran says, how has your experience with marketing to uh, direct primary care? Um, it seems that they try to keep all the treatments in-house since patients are on a monthly subscription basis. Is DPC direct primary care or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. Okay. that's, that's an it. excellent, excellent, excellent point. So when I got out, I was like, all right, I'm going to talk to all the direct primary care docs. And for those that don't know, the primary care docs, it's like a monthly membership throughout the system. And yeah, I found that exact experience. I mean, they keep stuff they really should not be keeping um, to the detriment of the patient. And like, you know, they make stuff up. They do SI joint injections blind. Um, you know, things that you would never see, like sending ankle bimalleal or ankle fractures out without weight bearing x-rays, stuff that really bothers you, right? So they're not been my best referral source. Um, so yes, I have found it difficult. They only tend to send to me after they've tried something and it's failed. Um, but they're really hesitant to because I think that's part of their value proposition is keeping it. So it's interesting that the pendulum has actually swung from in-system referring out all the time to out of the system, keeping more stuff than they probably should, you know, because they're not musculoskeletal experts, a lot of them, unless they, you know, they did a sports medicine fellowship or something like that. Um, you know, and it's like the same way, like I don't treat diabetes. Like, could I legally like, yes, would I do a good job? Like, no. Um, so part of the thing is finding who is the best referral source. For me, it's been oddly, it's been chiropractors, which maybe isn't that odd. They see cash-based patients, they're all musculoskeletal injuries, and they love the fact that, you know, there's a, they're treating the spine and someone's got a shoulder problem. They just have me come in the office and see them for the shoulder. So to answer your question, I found the DPC docs, and it's not just me. I've talked to direct rheumatologists, direct uh, dermatologists, and we've all sort of found similar issues, and I'll have a little bit of a gripe with it. So, But the good refer referral sources are out there. You just need to find them, but it might not be direct primary care docs. Perfect. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dr. T, Dr. T uh, has a question. If, if I take the course but want more help from Dr. Paul, is that possible outside the private group? Yeah. So I have a link there where you can kind of book time with me. You know, obviously I charge for it. Before I did that, people would just want to pick your brain and you end up, you know, but you'll find that if you do this model and you get into it, you're going to get a lot of questions about it, which is good. And honestly, if you just have simple questions you want to ask me, just ask me over LinkedIn and I'll, I'll just respond. Or in the, I was going to say in the private group. Yeah, or in the private group, yeah, right? Post, I mean, you I can be close to the private group. is probably going to be the fastest way for, for responses. Right, right. But yeah, either way like that, like, look, I'm not trying to charge you if you have like a question, but if you want to like dominate my time for an hour and I'm just going to be explaining things for an hour, like I do charge for that. But that is an ability on the website page where you can book uh and pay for it if that's something you want to do i think the course probably ha has the information's all distilled down with lectures so i think that's probably more useful unless like you want to know like something about your specific situation or like some sort of you know the idiosyncrasy yeah uh, a few more questions um are you uh e-scribing narcotic meds so i'm not so again like again with all these systems the I improve them as I go. We're not talking perfect systems. And when you build a model like this, you don't always have perfect solutions. So I'm not, in my state, I can handwrite them. But you would probably need to find an additional sort of uh, system to do that. Although it's possible. I mean, all that stuff's possible, but it's not something that I'm doing. We're going to take, because uh, we're almost at top of the hour, and I want to be mindful of Dr. Paul's uh, time. So we're going to take a few more questions. So get them in now, people. Uh, we're just going to burn through them. Can you take a few more questions, Dr. Paul? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. All right. Uh, 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 can you can you do hybrid? I've seen some practices doing both insurance and cash pay. Um, usually the hybrid practices that end up working are stuff insurance won't pay for, like your PRPs or your aesthetics or things. So you can certainly do that. And if you're, you're shifting from it, 
But again, it's hard to run two business models in, in the same at the same time. So if you create an autonomous business model, you may do it. But you know, insurance is gonna, still going to dominate all your time. And kind of the whole point of this model is getting away from all that. But people are doing it. It is being done. But you'll find that when they do hybrid, as their cash gets more successful, they'll just stop. They'll start doing less and less insurance. Yeah, and I think possible. I mean, I never did. I'm, I'm fully out. Like I've opted out of Medicare, but you, you can do it. Yeah. And, you know, my, my recommendations to physicians as well is like, you have to be savvy, a savvy business person. And you don't look, you don't need an MBA for this. All the education you need is online and everything. But some of those things you have to sit down and just ask yourself, okay, like what's the bread and butter of my practice? Like what actually brings in the most money and what, you know, like then you figure out what levers do, because then when you do that, you might figure out that like, oh, based on these things, like it's these cash based procedures and maybe it doesn't make up all the revenue that you're going to end up losing. But what my biggest thing, and I think that's what Dr. Paul is saying, is that if you decide that you're going to go full on and commit to it, you get to focus on those cash-based procedures, which is going to force you, it's going to be a forcing function for you to get more creative about how do you build a business around those things. Versus if you're just doing it half-hearted, you're always going to end up doing more insurance because you're going to be spending more time chasing down bills and payments and everything. Dr. Paul, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. Like I said, it's such a dominant force in the in the world of medicine that it, it just it'll run your life you're forced to play a game that they make all the rules to so as long as you're playing that game it's going to take up a majority of your your mental energies and and, and physical energies as well um totally. but yeah again i mean i think you get the most benefit from this model when you fully disconnect yourself from that stuff but again mm. not you know there's a way to do it i mean yeah um, Dr. Ozude says, is there an opportunity for membership model for chronic OA patients? I thought about it. I mean, if you're giving someone an injection, like every few months, you probably could do that. And they might agree to do that as well. And then, you know, you could bundle in a replacement. I mean, there's a, you, you can be as creative as you want for this sort of stuff. Um, I tend to just charge them the same price. So I don't have like a follow-up price. Unless it's like a fracture or something, then I'll offer them a different price for like the same episode of care. But if they pay me like 400 bucks this year for an injection, if I don't change my price, it's going to be the same price the next year. So I just charge them as they need it. But if you get creative about it, you might be able to bundle some things that you see together. But again, then you also have to convince the patients of this too. It's an extra sell. And some of them just, they don't, they just want to get it done and kind of get out and not think about that stuff. But, um, I think there's certainly a place for it. And if you're creative enough, I, th I think you can figure it out for sure. Perfect. Uh, let's see. We got a couple. Uh, uh, do you, so Dr. Uh, Sritha says, do you provide telehealth visits? If so, what platform do you use? So I do. I do less of them now. But actually, since I signed that business agreement with like uh, Google Workspace, the uh, Google Meet is, is HIPAA compliant. So I would just do it over that and set it up. Um, I have online forms. I send them out through my Google forms. And so they can fill out all my paperwork before I see them. You know, during COVID, I was allowed to do telehealth legally in like a bunch of other states with only one medical license. They kind of got rid of that. With telehealth, I mean, you can do a lot with it, but, you know, you're charging less. It, there, there, there ends up being like problems sometimes with them not getting on or connecting or it ends up being a lot more like a lot more work in a weird way. But you can certainly do it. And like I said, that the, the Google workspace is like, you, you can build it out to do that. Um, then it's your own platform, just like any sort of Google meet. It's just HIPAA compliant. Perfect. Well, I think that kind of concludes our webinar. Thank you all uh, for joining Dr. Paul. Uh, any, any last words before we sign off? Uh, I mean, the system is bad. It's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. The longer you stay in it, the more miserable you be, you, you, you'll be. In, and we know this is a fact. So if we keep doing the same stuff we're doing. It's going to be the same. If we want things to change, then, then we need to change. And I think this is a viable way of making it work. And it's one way to do it. Um, so like I said, either, either we stay the same and it's miserable or we improve ourselves, improve the lives of our patients for the better by offering some things that are not offered right now. Absolutely. And I think, um, again, it's, it's, it's exciting because I think there's a lot of people who are really burned out and this kind of gives them a breath of fresh air and something energized to, to do. Um, I just want to remind everybody, so A, there's a CME credit for this. Uh, if you registered for this, um, you can check it in the comment section or I'll be emailing everybody tomorrow morning. You'll be able to watch this and replay. And again, just 
take advantage of it, buy the course. You'll unlock 35 CME credits with it. You can get $1,000 off, but for a limited time. Course is usually is normally uh, thirty two ninety seven, and uh, for this uh, promo, just go to insurancefreemedicalpractice.com. Use code webinar promo. You get a thousand dollars off of the course. You get the course. Those you'll un- be able to unlock thirty five CME credits and the private group where you can en- engage with their peers and Dr. Paul. So, with that being said, Dr. Paul, thank you so much for joining. This has been another episode of the State of MedTech. Be sure to follow our page on on LinkedIn, on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, and other places. That way you can get alerted when we have new episodes like this. For uh, Bye for now, everyone, and have a great evening.